you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. This is the Ferrari 612 Scaglietti, the last in a long line of V12 front-engined 2 plus 2 Grand Tourers dating back to the company's inception. I suppose then it deserves a proper introduction. What you're thinking aren't the ff and later the gtc4 lusso the real last of line the final traditional ferrari four-seater before the introduction of the new puro sung suv well i don't think so for a couple of reasons first off this is still a traditional coupe shape whereas those cars introduced a new rather radical shooting brake body style and those also had a very complicated and clever all-wheel drive system whereas this is a very classic meat and potatoes front engine rear wheel drive. It's certainly not what you might call a looker, however it is imposing at about 4.9 meters long, or to put it another way, the same as an F10 generation BMW M5. Though the styling is not award winning, it certainly does look better in person than in photos, the engines are. This was the final car to receive a version of Ferrari's F133 65 degree 48 valve V12. First seen in the 456, then later the 550 and 575M. It's also the most powerful road going variant, making 540 horsepower, 434 pound foot of torque, that's 588 newton meters. And this car was actually due to have an entirely different power plant, the Enzo derived 6 litre unit found in the 599. That that may be one of the reasons this car was actually called the 612. However, for reasons unknown, Ferrari decided not to use that engine. I believe the thinking behind it was that this perhaps wasn't seen as the right model to introduce a version of that engine in a production car. The interior of the 612 is, as you'd hope for a flagship four-seater Ferrari, absolutely wondrous. A feast of leather and um, more leather. It feels a little bit like a prototype 599 in here, and if you know those cars, you'll recognize elements of this. So the HVAC controls here, the trio of fans up here, and the general dash layout is more or less identical. But there are also pieces of slightly older Ferrari, like this, to be honest, hateful little gear lever down here, and the steering wheel I love because, unlike most modern stuff which is carbon fiber, it's aluminium with buttons on. Later, Scaglietti's got a Manatino, but this has a more Enzo-like setup that I actually really rather like. Even more than that, this is probably the last Ferrari you could actually start with just the key. No silly start buttons in here. I like it a lot. The only bad bit really is that as four seaters go, though headroom in the back isn't an issue, legroom is. Consider this a three seater, and you'll be fine. The Scraggly Betty was also the final Ferrari four-seater to be introduced with a manual gearbox option. However, by the time the car debuted in 2004, the company was already selling far more F1 box cars over manuals across the lineup, and this was no different, with the vast majority being the F1 six-speed paddle shift transmission. Today, we pick up one of these for between 70 and 90,000 pounds, and unsurprisingly, it's the manuals which really command a premium. The only one currently for sale is up at 130 grand. 
On its launch, the car received general praise, but some people weren't so happy with the handling. In 2006, Ferrari introduced two packages to combat this, the HGTS and the HGTC, which added 7.5 or 15.5 thousand pounds to the already rather chunky 183 thousand pound asking price. This car, brought to me by its owner Robert, is an HGTS, and visually there is very little to identify it. They came from factory with a different colour for the calipers, but the most obvious change is these new split rim alloy wheels. The majority of alterations were made to the mechanical side of things, where the car received slightly stiffer springs, a different anti-roll bar, revised programming for the dampers, quicker software for the gearbox, now 150 millisecond changes down from 180 millisecond, and most importantly, a sports exhaust. For the extra £8,000 of the HGTC pack, you got all of that stuff and carbon ceramic brakes. Now, as it happens in this day and age, 80 odd thousand pounds for a flagship four seater V12 Ferrari seems like a relative bargain. But I think we all know that with a car such as this, the purchase price is only the beginning. Something I've learned very painfully over the last few months with the 550 Marinello, a car hereafter known as the Rosso Corsa Judas. More on that in a separate video. Unfortunately, things haven't all been plain sailing for Robert with his car either, and helpfully he's put together a little guide of all the things that have gone wrong on this car and what it's cost to put right. Robert has had this car now for about three years, and in that time it's had around £17,000 spent on it, not all by Robert. And that was a mixture of both scheduled servicing, cosmetic stuff, and also a few failures too. As it happens, the first thing on this car that broke was the one most people worry about, the F1 gearbox, and it actually was the cheapest thing of all to fix. So I have some paperwork here detailing what's actually gone wrong with the car. The cause of that failure was actually a sensor, and the cost to fix was about £600. That was covered by the warranty he got when he bought it. After that, a new shock absorber was required. That was around £1,000. Then a new radiator. That was really expensive at three grand. In 2020, he got a number of things done, including the clutch, the rear brakes, both discs and pads, and some new drive shaft boots. He also touched up some of the cosmetics, and that was a £6,000 spend. Most recently, he did another large job, costing just a little bit less, which was, again, a mixture of stuff he chose to do and stuff he needed to. So the dash had shrunk a little bit, very common on all of these cars, including some of the newer ones. The big belt service was done, and some of the suspension components were also replaced. Ball joints, bushes, and so on. The wiper motor failed as well, and the whole cost of this was about five grand in all. The big problem, though, wasn't really the cost of it, but the time because to get that work done took 12 months. Not all of these old Ferraris are that bad to maintain. Some can be far easier on the wallet, some far worse. However, in any case, they're not going to be a cheap thing to own and run, which means they really do need to be rather special when they are working to justify all the times that they aren't. So is this. You know something? I think it might be. Initial impressions of the 612 Scaglietti then, and this is actually the first of hopefully two reviews you'll see from me on a car just like this, because I'm off to Scotland fairly soon, and when I get there, I'm supposed to be driving one of these cars that is equipped with the manual gearbox. So that will be a really decent and very rare opportunity to see just how different a Ferrari is with the manual versus the F1. One thing I can tell you for absolute certain is the fact that um, in auto mode, this car is atrocious. The other thing, which is utterly and completely baffling, and I've no idea why it's happening, and I've never really experienced this in a car before, is this feels a bit like an anechoic chamber. It might be because I came here today in a 911 Targa with the roof down, so I'm used to being absolutely battered by the car. However, this feels like an incredibly well insulated cabin. I actually just checked to see if this had double glazing in it, but um, it does not. I've got a really weird reverb. I can hear my own voice far more than I normally would, and that's really disconcerting because I, contrary to popular belief, hate 
the sound of my own voice. Anyway, in order to drive one of these, is much the same as any other F1 equipped Ferrari. So at low speed, if you want the smooth experience, do lift as you change gear. In auto mode, it's utterly and totally hopeless. Doesn't know when to change, you don't know when it's going to change, and when it does, it's very, very unsettling because you wind up lurching forwards and backwards, really not elegant at all. This is the sort of car that actually really would suit a torque converter automatic quite nicely. However, Ferrari never really been fans of them. They fitted them in very, very few of their cars. The last one ever to get one was actually this car's predecessor, the 456. And the box in that was hardly cutting edge, a four-speed auto. By the time this car came out, Ferrari were very heavily invested in their F1 gearbox tech, and soon we'll be able to see how it performs when you're pressing on, which traditionally is where it works its best. Happily, this engine appears to have lots and lots of torque from very low down. Despite a curb weight of about 1.9 tonnes, at no point ever does this car feel underpowered, it seems does sound really rather good though. I wish the 550 sounded this nice. Lovely little burble on the overrun. This is one of my most demanding sections of the test route that I use, and I can't really tell you just how bad this section of road is. If you recognise it, you'll know very well, and actually, this is doing a really rather decent job. For a car that you expect to have serious sporting credentials, I'm actually very impressed with the body control. I'm currently in normal drive mode. The only option I've got activated is the faster F1 gearbox, and that's about it. We have a sport button on the wheel, and I'll engage that in a little bit. I'm not sat in the ideal position, I will confess, because the motor on this seat appears to have given up the ghost, or I think more accurately, the button has. So I've got some adjustment, but if I try to go forward, there's nothing there. I'm worried that if I push backwards it'll go back and then not go forwards. However, squiffy seat aside, one thing that is really surprising me about this car is just how comfortable I feel in it. I've just got out of a 911 and historically those should be a car which feel very compact and are really easy to place. This thing is absolutely enormous, so you'd reasonably expect that it perhaps feels a little bit daunting to drive, and yet I've just hopped in it and driven it and just not worried. I'm about to weave through some parked cars and a van and stuff like that, and I know exactly where every single piece of this car is. Hilariously, this actually has a view out I'd more associate with a 911 than the current 911. So those headlight pods are housed in a fairly pronounced arch at each side, and that gives you a real sense of where the front is. The fact it's a very long car isn't too much of an issue. It's usually width and front visibility that is the problem. So now we're on a nice quiet stretch with good visibility and national speed limit. Let's see what the final iteration of the F133 engine has got to give. It's good. It's really good. It's not the sort of rampant savagery of a 599 or the later F12, but it's more than adequate to get you from A to B with a big smile on your face. The response is absolutely pin sharp, as you would expect, and it just doesn't really ever seem to give up. If anything, I would say it's a car where it's very easy to run into the red line, which is here about seven and a half thousand, because the car feels like it wants to just keep going. I have to make a slight correction, actually. I thought the car wasn't in sport mode. I knew the F1S light was on, but that you'll get in many modes in these things. The sport button here, I pressed, and then that light went out. So actually, I was already in the sporty mode. 
That means that even in the more aggressive setting, this thing is remarkably well damped. It reminds me very much of the DB9 that I drove recently. That was a car that had the sports pack in, and in real time, that was only 24 hours ago, in more or less the same weather, on the same road. So it's one of those rare instances where I feel quite confident to draw a parallel. This, I'd say, is a little bit harsher. Over the little lumps and bumps where the tarmac's been patched up, the car shakes and shimmies just a little bit more. The Aston felt a little bit more composed my life this has got some serious go in it the truth is though the numbers down here aren't actually all that big but that's not really a problem i've always been more about the sensation of speed rather than the actual speed itself steering is also quite nice it's a little on the light side but it's very sharp as you expect now from all modern ferraris however not unsettling you can easily do big miles in this and as it turns out its owner has he's put 10,000 on this car picked it up at around 43,000 and it's now sat proudly on 53 <laughs> great too. In fairness, unless you're really, really quite committed, I would say even at higher RPM, do still lift off a little bit. It will give you a smoother experience. If you've got passengers in the car, I think they'll appreciate that. You can also, like the sports cars, blip the throttle a little bit yourself. That makes it just a little bit quicker to shift and a touch more involving. The noise is brilliant. Grip level, yeah, decent. Clarkson, chapter 8, verse 9. This is unbelievable. Absolutely incredible. As it happens, that 1.9 tonne curb weight might sound like quite a bit, but that's less than it could have been thanks to an all aluminium construction, which is very close to the one you'll find in a 599. Ooh, let's try my three-point turn hill start torture test pattern pending. This is where cars like this can often fall apart. So into reverse by hooking the silly, silly little lever down there. I do believe there are parking cameras and things, but I'm not sure how you activate them. Then, oh, the ECU has just failed. That's good to know. Ah, oh, handbrake is not working very well. And uh, yeah, we have an engine control light, but we don't seem to be on reduced power. Not sure what's going on there. May quickly pause, turn the car off and on again. That happened exactly as I sort of tipped the car back down a fairly steep hill, and I suspect that may be related. Hold, please. Key off, out. This probably isn't long enough to really properly reset it, but. Yeah, the warning's still there. Anyway, this, I suppose, is a very good cue to talk to you about what it's really like to have some of these older Ferraris. First thing you need to know, if the car still feels fine, all pipe down, then it probably is. Maybe something really quite insignificant. Sometimes what happens is that something just goes ever so slightly outside of its preset parameters, and this means that it triggers a warning which you can't then get rid of very easily, but the car is actually unaffected. You also need to be aware that because they are generally quite highly strung things, they're quite complicated, put together by a fairly small team of Italians, anything the car does or says in the first minute can safely be ignored. Likewise, any warning that just comes up once can generally be ignored. If it crops up multiple times, that's when you need to worry. The car's still letting me change gear at full speed, the car's still giving me all the RPM and the engine feels just as strong as it did, so I've no reason to believe anything's really 
significantly wrong here. However, if you're the sort of person that finds it difficult to sleep at night when your car's got a warning light in it, um, maybe don't buy one of these. <laughs> From about five to seven and a half, this thing is really making a mockery of this road. Tell you what, let's back off for a little bit and let's see what the gear change is like without the sporty mode engaged and find out what the whole car's really like actually. I think the suspension does back off just a little bit, but not really that much to write home about. Let's see how fast the shift is then with the uh, sport mode off. Yeah, there's a, there's a deliberate pause. There's still, there's still a shove, so note that, and then here's with sport mode on. Yeah, it is quite a bit quicker. You do really notice that. So I've talked to you a little bit about some of the running costs of one of these cars and as you might imagine it doesn't always end there because if you do want to put miles on it, fuel is a concern. Robert has been very sensible and hasn't calculated how bad this is on fuel. Although, if it is like the 550 and there's no guarantee of that, it's probably a little bit better than some of the newer cars. The 550 on a run will do actually about 22 to the gallon, which always impressed me. The F12, to give you an example, does about 15 and a half, and the 599 is actually worse than the F12. This I would expect maybe is somewhere in the middle there, but it's not great, however you look at it. Luckily, Ferrari at the very least had the good graces to fit an enormous fuel tank, 110 litres. For my friends across the pond, that's 29 of your pathetically small American gallons. Robert is friendly with a number of 612 owners and he says that they actually do tend to use their cars and with good reason. He's found the examples which get used more frequently tend to be the more reliable. I know the last batch of work he had done to this put the car off the road for a year but there was a lot going on all at the same time and it hasn't exactly been plain sailing for everyone over the last 12 months so I wouldn't take that sort of thing as gospel. That being said, the biggest issue with cars like this is not actually ever the cost of parts. They're not cheap, they never really are, but they're often not really dramatically different to say an old Japanese car now, or in some cases a 911. The issue is twofold. It's the time to get all the work done or simply to source the parts, and it's the availability. I don't know what it's like for the 612, but they're still a relatively recent car. 456s, I can tell you, have certain items that are now no longer available. And it's when you come across that kind of thing, you need to be worried. For this reason, if you're buying into a 612 where the owner is honest enough to tell you it needs things doing, if they're the sort of thing that sound like they're relatively easy and you're wondering perhaps there's a reason they haven't actually done that themselves, it's worth checking if there is. Perhaps that small part that you could normally get easily for anything else, you just cannot get anymore. I know of no particular example where that's true on these, but it's something worth bearing in mind. Crikey, this, this is unbelievable. This is comfier than the 911 I drove here this morning. And let's put it through the most demanding section. This is going to be a little bit of a bum squeaker, this. This bit here, if a car's not really well set up, it'll smack the ground. Now, I didn't go full pelt there. I'll admit that. The real test is full pelt through there, and I've chickened out. But it did fine. Brilliantly damned. Oh, cyclists. Give them some space. The brakes actually, I think, are really quite nice. They did receive criticism at the time, and I suspect if you took this car on track, which would be a stupid idea, or you drove it that hard for that long, you may find some fade. But from my perspective, they seemed okay. They've always given me what I've asked, and that's all I really need. The pedal is actually quite progressive. The gear shift paddles are actually a good size. I like the fact that they're aluminium. No, the steering isn't the most feelsome, but it's a little lighter. It's less hyperactive than some other Ferraris. And for a GT orientated car, that is kind of what you'd want. I actually love the shape of this armrest here. The interior is one area of the 612 I thought might let it down, but actually it doesn't at all. 
very nice blend of old and new school Ferrari. The Speedo is borderline useless because it goes up to 220 mile an hour, but luckily there is also a digital readout on the left screen as well. Like many of Ferrari, it's the engine and gearbox that do seem to dominate proceedings. The engine has enough punch to really impress and to excite, but not really to overwhelm the car or your senses. The gearbox, likewise, you are thinking about it all the time, and it's not as refined as even the later F1 boxes, but if you're willing to put up with it, it isn't actually entirely terrible. And the sensor failure aside, it has actually been quite reliable. Putting a clutch on one of these isn't ruinously expensive. It costs actually less than or similar to, say, an Aston Martin V8 Vantage. Budget a good few thousand pounds. Driven properly and sensibly, they can actually last quite a while too. With the 550, for example, many people seem to cite around 40,000 miles as a good example. However, the truth is with clutches, it's very much up to the owner. So if they haven't looked after the car properly, they don't know how to use the gearbox or the clutch. If it's a manual, then they can wear it out very, very quickly. That's what happens when you get a car with this amount of power. But driven correctly, they can last. Oh, there's motorway speeds. <laughs> I think the 612's biggest problem is and has always been the way that it looks. It just isn't pretty. And for many people, when you're talking about Ferraris, that is a deal breaker and a, a perfectly understandable one. But buy it in the right shade, a silver like this, or preferably a dark hue, a nice blue, something like that, and it's not entirely intolerable. The main thing is though, the experience from in here is genuine, full-blooded Ferrari. This does not feel watered down, cut price, or anything of the sort. It's the full V12 experience. And what a V12. A fitting way, I think, to send out a great engine. And, as I've got the opportunity to revisit one of these in a very short space of time, I think for now, that's all I need to say about this car. So, a big thank you to Robert for lending it to me. Thanks to you for watching. Please like, comment down below, Subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.